see that everybody, um, that there are some new faces here, but also uh, uh, some of you uh, who are regulars, and uh, both uh, um, Roger uh, Lewis, uh, my co-chair, and I are delighted that uh, you're with us here today for, I think, a, a lecture that um, I've long looked forward to. Um, uh, with our featured speaker, Professor Roger Owen from Harvard University. I have to uh, say my apologies uh, right up front. I'm going to have to uh, leave in a couple of minutes to meet with uh, a donor, unfortunately, that uh, couldn't um, be moved. And uh, um, uh, so I will, uh, I will have to bow out early, but um, uh, Roger will share the session and, in fact, introduce Professor Owen, who will be speaking on historical perspective on the Arab Spring, a theme that has been with us uh, this, this semester and, in fact, the last uh, couple of uh, semesters we've had speakers on the subject. Uh, to remind everybody, ne next week, April 15th, we'll have Jill Bennett with us, the historian with the uh, former historian with the British Foreign and Commonwealth Relations Office on six moments of crisis inside British foreign policy. Um, with that, uh, with thanks to the AHA and to the National History Center for co-sponsoring this event, I'll turn it over to Roger. Uh, Roger Owen's most recent uh, book, as many of you will know, is The Rise and Fall of Arab Presidents uh, for Life. He is the professor of Middle Eastern history uh, at Harvard and former director of the Middle Eastern Center at Harvard. Uh, but before then, uh, he was the director of the Middle Eastern Center at St. Anthony's College, Oxford. And it was in Oxford that he became famous for his work on the economic history of the uh, Middle East. Uh, among his books, his many books, uh, there is a famous co-edited volume called Suez 1956. Uh, and more recently, he has written a biography of Evelyn Baring, Lord Cromer. Uh, this is a book that is of unusual significance because of its historical context, and I read it uh, with a certain fascination because I cannot think of any two more different people than Roger Owen and Lord Cromer. And all the more uh, because of the sort of grudging admiration that creeps through the pages of the biography of uh, Lord Cromer. Uh, Roger Owen is going to speak to us this afternoon on historical perspective on the Arab Spring. Roger Owen. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, I just want to start with um, drawing Roger's attention and everybody's attention to an extraordinary historical coincidence and connection in that 20 years ago, almost to the day when I was spending the spring term in Austin, Texas, I gave my first talk to the British Studies ceremony, <laughs> se se seminar about Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> and I remember one of uh, Roger's colleagues saying, I hope you don't go in and talk all about how she whacks people with handbags and so on. And I said, no, I will be suitably reverential. And, uh, um, and then she dies today, of course, and um, the news is filled with her attempt by, actually not bad, uh, huge number of people to try and find her place for her in uh, British history. Somebody said she was the best, there have been two, she was one of the two best British prime ministers since the Second World War and as this person said the first was Clement Attlee who created the welfare state, I felt that is an intelligent fellow, otherwise people <laughs> seem to have forgotten um, about that particular Labour government but were in awe of her for the Falklands and so on. All right. Um, so I'm t to talk about historical perspectives on the, Ari uh, on the Arab Spring, on the assumption, I suppose, that we're all historians and the past is prologue. Did Shakespeare really say that? I saw it on the... He did. Shakespeare, where does he say that? I think it's in, um, in, in Before Henry V. Ah, uh, right. Henry 
I remember seeing it outside the National Archives in Washington and wondering where it came from. It sounded more American than Shakespearean to me, but anyway, the past is prologue. So I'll begin with some definitions from the title Arab Spring. <coughs> Arab Spring. So I think the first point to make is that it is an Arab event, a pan-Arab event, which in some senses has united the Arab world, including North Africa, which is sometimes treated as a separate part, in a way that I don't remember in my lifetime, except for occasional events like Suez or something or other, when one would, in the NASA period, when one would find people right across the Arab world inspired, excited, in the same kind of way, and using more or less the same language. Um, uh, but I also want to make the point, would you like to come in, sir? An Antonian arrival. Go, go ahead, and we'll go. Yes, so let's see. Yeah. Uh, let's say I'm a little bit concerned about the sound. Can everyone at the back hear oh, Roger? Yes, I'm, okay. I'm too much at my leisure, perhaps. Okay. I thought I was, my uh, House of Commons voice would travel across the room. Is that better? It's very difficult to hear back here without the mic. Okay. My, both my grandfathers were Protestant clergymen, and I always thought that they, I got from them the ability to talk to the back of any large assembly, but uh, I seem to be wrong. Anyway, anybody who can't hear me, please put up their hand at any stage, and I will. Is that okay, sir? This is, this is okay. All right. So I'm trying to, I'm beginning by saying that the Arab Spring was an Arab event and that it was felt across the Arab world from Morocco to the Gulf, but differentially in different kinds of ways. Um, and I think one can see the Arab world divided into three, and I shall try and say something about the three component parts. If you put Egypt, if you include Egypt in North Africa, you have a set of well, relatively well-established states traditions um, where there is um, uh, uh, a relatively long history of, of government and some kind of um, uh, match between state and nation. So the impact of the Arab Spring in North Africa is of one character. And when we talk about the Arab Spring, we're, you find people are generally talking about Egypt, although there is a nod to perhaps why the Spring isn't so strong in other kinds of places. But the eastern part of the Arab world um, is, ex is extremely differ different. And people talk a lot about uh, Sykes-Picot at the moment and the division of the eastern part of the Arab world as something that we need to revisit. And I think we do not because anybody can really imagine redrawing the boundaries, but nevertheless, it is interesting to remember what it was like for a couple of gentlemen, Sykes and Pico and a few others, to try and imagine who lived in the eastern part of the Arab world. They came to the conclusion, yes, there were, there were Jews who, had an his, who came from, who had a historic connection with Palestine. There were Armenians who had a historic collection, connection with Armenia, there were a few other people. They were the Lebanese Christians who the French remembered at the last minute. Um, but for the rest, it was a kind of inchoate place full of people called Arabs, perhaps living on, riding about on camels and so on. And there is an artificiality to ba about that. But there is also um, an inconsistent and sectarian social mix in Syria and Iraq. I think if one thinks of the sectarian geography of the Middle East, you think of the ways in which going back into the uh, 10th and 11th and 12th centuries after the Fatimid period, various kinds of heretical <coughs> Muslims took refuge in the mountains away from the Sunni dominance of the major towns the, from the uh, Salahuddin onwards. And therefore you find in the Syrian mountains uh, and the Lebanese mountains, you find Druze and you find Alawis and so on. And in the uh, Iraqi mountains, you find a curious mix of people, including Yazidis, fire worshippers, leftover Zoroastrians, and something or other. And because I'm in Washington, I might mention uh, um, when General Petraeus 
decided to have a representative municipal council in Mosul in the north, he had Yazidi representation. I think because he'd been reading a book by Peter Slugger, a colleague of mine, which reminded everybody of that. And it may be because when asked by what he should do by George Bush, George Bush said had representative government. And for some reason or other, it was decided that the representative government should be based on sect and community, a most extraordinary decision, which has sectarianized Iraq in a way that it never had been before. But that, so that's by the by, but... Uh, because I'm in Washington, I feel I need to get my awe in about uh, the many strange mistakes that were made in the early days of the Iraqi uh, occupation. So, now, spring. It began by being called spring, these events, as we know, with Mr. Bouazizi in Tunisia and so on, on the line of the, and it was even called, I think, the, uh, oh, it's gone from my head. It, uh, it, the, the springs all had colors at that particular stage because it was like the Prague Spring. Uh, this, I think the, it was called the Jasmine Spring, the Jasmine Spring. And springs, it seemed to me, are very different from revolutions, and I shall come on, this is the, the point I'm trying to get to, that springs are, a, as far as I can see, an effort, a peaceful effort by crowds in the street to take you back to something before the present. There is an, a return to some sort of ideal. Um, in the case of the Prague Spring, whatever Czech, Czechoslovakia was before the Russian occupation and so on. So they have a different character, and there was a brief period of spring before, I think, Amr Musa, the uh, ex-Secretary uh, General of the Arab League, was the first um, Arab who I heard called it a revolution, a thawra, um, in about 10 days after Tahrir, that this is a revolution. And, of course, revolution is a completely different kind of thing. It is a total restructuring of the... Uh, political order. It has a sense, I think I tell my students, of revolution, that is a circle, that what is at the bottom becomes at the top. And from, as we know from uh, history, revolutions are at least bloody revolutions which start with the overthrow of an established order, like the fall of the Bastille, are um, moments of enthusiasm, as I shall suggest, constitutional moments, there is a kind of revolutionary calendar that comes in, which everybody is familiar with, and um, they have a different character. And I shall end by saying, of course, we're only uh, two years into a revolutionary process, which most people think, at least as far as Egypt and Tunisia is con are concerned, has many years to run. And of course, if you're thinking in this particular kind of way, what happened in... Uh, I sometimes sit with Robert Danton, the new wi the Widener, the historian of France, and talk about these revolutionary days and what it must have been like to be outside the Bastille in 1789 in this extraordinary moment of enthusiasm. And then we have 18, we have 1794 and the famous whip of whiff of grape shot, and somebody called Napoleon Bonaparte appears to save the revolution from itself. So there are all kinds of possibilities contained within this revolutionary moment, which uh, we have to consider, because for some reason or other, this seems to be imprinted in people's memories around the world. And perhaps you can, uh, you can, I can get some guidance. I mean, w w when you come to the revolutionary calendar, you decide it's a revolution. There are the people present in manifesting themselves in a form of theater that was described by the uh, uh, Lynn Hunt, Berkeley historian. Berkeley historian. Lynn Hunt, a long time ago, as the theater of the people. The people manifest it themselves. They display themselves. It's a kind of existential moment. And then you have a republic, which is based on the notion of the sovereignty of the people. And you have this effort, somehow or other, to give shape and form to this, from me coming from a monarchical tradition, a much more difficult moment, particularly when the people are so much present and so much determined, whoever the people are, of course. I mean, we're talking about the people who are in, uh, in the capital city, the people who are able to manifest themselves, are determined to have a say in the future constitutional arrangements. And this is an extremely... Um, 
disturbing and worried moment. And you can well imagine how various people in revolutionary moments in various histories wanted the people to go home. They want them to be demobilized. They want the streets back. Um, they don't want the people around interfering with the constitutional process in various kinds of ways. Um, so uh, that's th the beginning of my subject matter, the kind of how we get from the notion of revolution to a, uh, to a revolutionary calendar, which involves elections, which involves trying to draw up a new constitution, and why this should be de rigueur. I mean, why should the Egyptians feel that they have to follow the same revolutionary calendar as the French? I do not know, except it must be firmly imprinted, this particular notion, however it's described. Of course, you do also have questions of translation. The great dispute between Bernard Lewis and, uh, and uh, Edward Said, if anybody cares to remember, <laughs> was Bernard Lewis said that the Arabs can't do revolution because they, the only word they have is thawra, which doesn't actually mean revolution. It means the noise made by a camel as it rises to its feet, which in, of course, you have to go into Arab dictionaries at that stage, and you can, in fact, find Thaura defined in that particular kind of way, but it has come to mean in the modern world revolution. Well, we don't, I don't quite know because there isn't, one of the things the Arabic lacks as most other languages is something like the Oxford English Dictionary. So one can't trace etymology, one can't trace meanings of words back. But I think somehow or other in the general uh, worldliness of everything and education and so on, Thaura and revolution come together, and therefore, if you have a revolution, various things then follow. So that's the next bit I want to talk about. Uh, particularly in North Africa, particularly where it was successful and set in the re uh, motion a process of uh, creating a new order based on popular sovereignty. It is a republican form of government. Um, so I want to say some words about the logic of this process and then some, le some of the lessons from history which might help illuminate what is happening and what is yet to come. And this is involves the observation now uh, mixed with what we know of other revolutions, the French in particular, with a nod towards the American um, and various other attempts in human history in order to give meaning to this notion of popular sovereignty within a new constitution which is to define the new political order, how power is allocated, what kind of institutional structure you're going to get. I mean, as, as, as an aside, um, and there are people who talk about this, these constitutional moments and moments of enthusiasm, it's worth thinking about the American constitution and how, somebody will correct me, 25 white gentlemen came to draw up a document that begins, we the people, by what right, um, there's a kind of, what, trick involved, or there is a retreat into um, some notion of constitutional moments, moments of enthusiasm, where all kinds of things suddenly become possible, which could not be possible before, and it is possible for certain people with a certain authority to um, step forward in order to try and um, to try and uh, mold, to shape, to draw the words of the new political order. And um, I'm sure I'm talking to people who know all about this, but um, members of the Harvard History Department refuse to be excited by this process. They lecture about revolutions, but when they actually see a revolution happening under their nose, they show no interest in it at all. And also I teach American students who have, of course, a different, very different idea of what is called the revolutionary process in America. And, but it's difficult to get them going too, so one of, I want to provoke people into getting going and uh, explaining to me various things that I don't quite understand about these, the logic of these kinds of moments and the existentialness of these moments when people, well, well when people feel new things um, expectations are raised, and there is this universal sense that there is no going back. Whatever has happened, something has happened. A page in history has been turned, and politics can only be about the new order. 
Of course, there is such a thing as counter-revolution. We may come to that, but that's not, it's not clear where that fits into the present scene. Okay. So, you, what do you do? You have an election for... Well, you have a constituent assembly. And in the um, Egyptian case and the Tunisian case, it was decided that the constituent assembly should be elected by the people. So the, the, the revolutionary calendar is we must have a new constitution. How do we have a new constitution? We have a constituent assembly. How do we have a constituent? We have elections. Politics then enters. Who stands for elections? Who wins the elections? The religious parties in Egypt and Tunisia win the elections. The minute you have elections, after a dictatorship, they will, in, in a Muslim country anyway, they will be won by religious parties for reasons that are fairly clear to everybody, I imagine. They are better organized. They are not corrupt. Um, uh, they um, uh, uh, are better at bringing out the vote, and they seem to be the party of the future. One of the problems uh, to anticipate of something I'm also going to say is actually how unprepared the religious people are for government. There they have sat in jails, or in the case of Rashid Ghanoushi, the leader of the NAFTA in Tunisia, in, East, in West London, near the airport, for years and years and years, waiting for the revolution. But they don't seem to have plans. They don't seem to know what to do with the power. So you get a very, very complicated situation in which the constituent assembly, elected by the people, consists of religious gentlemen and other kinds of people who are then called upon to, say, address Article 1 of the Constitution. Tunisia is a Muslim country. Is it a Muslim country? And then some people say, we can't begin there. Tunisia is Tunisia. How does one define the country? Article 2. You get something very complicated going on here. Article 2 can only be understood with reference to Article 6. This is the Tunisian constitution at the moment. I mean, absolutely fascinating. I, never, I thought constitutions were completely boring. Um, but it is absolutely fascinating. The Tunisian constitution gets larger and larger. It's 253 articles at the last count as people add more and more. Well, we better have something about this. Oh, well, if we have something about this, we must have something about that. And on it goes. So this is the, the, the constitution. And meanwhile, the constituent assembly is actually governing the country. So it's faced with day-to-day -day political decisions. It is difficult to imagine a situation more confusing than the one in Egypt and um, Tunisia at the moment. Meanwhile, you have an unreformed police. You have a whole host of um, uh, hideous economic problems that accumulated under the dictatorship before. You have a European crisis, so the tourists aren't coming. And you have desertification and, the few, and absence of water. I mean, this is not in this talk, but in one I'm going to give in Washington in two days' time. It's, it also comes at a neoliberal neo moment in world history where the notion of planning, which used to be all the, the rage, no longer exists. Amar Musa, who I think was going to stand for president at one stage of Egypt, did say, we need plans. Not necessarily you know, this type of Nasserite, Stalinist, five-year plans, but at least some part of the system which is not concerned with short-term political gains um, that has, can take some long view of these, prob these problems. I mean, it's going to take, let us say you decide to have reform the police service in England, uh, in the Egypt, or reform the educational system. It's a 20 or 30 year project which revolutions might be able to deal with if uh, you know, planning was allowed and you had a strong central authority, but cannot be dealt with by a government like the Egyptian one, which is dependent on the IMF for immediate fiscal support in order to meet its huge financial problems. There is no room for the kind of long-term planning that is required in those circumstances. Um, 
So I think it, it's at this stage where people are revealed to be either e pessimists or optimists. Um, the muddle is such that you can either say this is part of the revolutionary process, hold tight to your seats, who knows what it will be like in three or four or five years' time. I think I vaguely remain in this context, but if you are a pessimist and you have a lower view of human nature, then you may think that this is a human muddle, um, over-determined, as we used to say, because of all these, the, the kinds of things that I've been saying. Popular sovereignty, elections, short-term electoral considerations, um, uh, the need to get money from the World Bank, the fact that no economists believe in planning anymore, at least not produced by any university that I know of, uh, who only believe neoliberal assumptions about the market and so on. A recipe for muddle, or so that's where I am the first bit of that. Um, that I think where we, that's where we are, at least at the eastern end, at the, west, at the uh, western end of the Arab world. The eastern end is, of course, more confused because of the sectarianism and so on in Syria and Iraq. And we could talk about that if people want, but the, uh, the, the spring was there seen as opportunity by the, or a fear by the, uh, by the rulers of Syria to put down the revolt before it got out of hand and start shooting people and so on. Whether the army shoots or not is one of the key determinants of all this. It didn't shoot in Tunisia and, and, uh, and, and uh, in Egypt, it shot in Syria. All right, now let me stand back and try, because this is a history seminar, um, to say something about previous constitutional moments in Syria, or at least the, just to mention the previous constitutional moments in Egypt and Tunisia associated with a similar desire for freedom and of the and to find a way of curbing um, a dict uh, dictatorial um, uh, regimes, dictatorial governments. Um, there were there was young Egypt in the late 19th century. There was young uh, Persia. There was young Turkey. And these were all moments in which they thought that the European notion of a constitution was the way to shackle the power of a dictator. And that was the initial point of being a constitutionalist. But within this and within legal traditions in the Middle East, which came much more from France than from England, Roger has mentioned Lord Cromer, the one thing he was unable to do in Egypt or chose not to do when he had pretty much absolute power from the late 1800s was to change the process of legal education. He left it in, hand, in the hands of the French, for better or worse. But anyway, the French tradition is clearly, and the French legal tradition provides for the creation of constitutional lawyers and so on, and access to a tradition in French of thinking and writing about constitutions which spills over to everybody's favorite early, early 19th century constitution, which is the Belgian, which provided a, uh, a model for many um, third world, uh, what we would now call ex-colonial developing countries and so on. Um, one of the points about uh, the Middle East at the moment, th there isn't a model. Actually, there is a model in Iran, but the Arabs think that the Iranians are fierce and bloody people and therefore not to be trusted, but you have an Islamic constitution working, which has been working since, you know, after a fashion, since um, 1979 in Tehran, which you can look at and say, you know, this works, this doesn't work. Um, and it's, a, but they chose not to, ha to choose that as a model. So there is no model except some previous constitutional experience of fiddling with some previous constitution. That, in so far as there is a model, is the model. Um, so uh, for what the rest of what I want to say, I will just draw some um, ideas from recent Egyptian history, going back to the constitutional experiment which began in 1922 to 23, to see what um, lessons we can learn from a previous attempt in a what was regarded as a revolutionary situation, although it was somewhat different. There was the great popular revolt against the British in Egypt in 1919, 
associated with the WAFT and the refusal of the uh, British to allow a delegation to proceed to the peace conference in order to put Egypt's case at the Versailles Peace Conference after the First World War, which led to something called the Milna Mission and, the, and, a and a decision by the British that they didn't actually need to occupy Egypt anymore, but could exercise a kind of indirect power, which led to the establishment of a constitutional monarchy and a new constitution in 1923, um, drawn up by Egyptian constitutional lawyers. So what can we, what, what, what can we learn from that? Um, well, first, I suppose, is um, uh, the existence, as I've just mentioned, of um, several generations of Egyptian constitutional lawyers or lawyers who, th who could think about constitutions. So there was the personnel, surplus on the ground and so on, who could have these rather complicated discussions that you need. I mean, I don't know how many people around here know enough about constitutions to draw up. I certainly wouldn't know where to begin. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a somewhat recherche and involved kind of activity, not something that is daily practiced around the world, particularly where you start from scratch to begin with and you have to work out the basic things of who you are, what sort of identity at the beginning, what kind of, uh, what, what kind of um, balance of power do you want between the various institutions of government and so on and so on. Um, so we have a brief period of parliamentary rule, and then this in initiates a brief period of our parliamentary rule dominated by the Waffle, um, the, the m major political party which wins every election, but then because it's thought to be dangerous by the king, every election is immediately fixed. So one of the things you, what is characteristic of this particular phase in Egyptian history is the constitution is constantly amended from the word go. And one of the important things, it seems to me, for the modern period is how on earth do you prevent somebody wanting to amend the constitution um, the minute it has been drawn up? I mean, there should be a kind of, um, you know, in, an, in an ideal world which we don't exist in, there should be a, um, uh, a self-denying ordinance that you allow the constitution to work as it did for uh, 10 years. But immediately the, the Egyptians for short-term electoral advantage are changing the number of um, members in the Egyptian parliament. It goes up and down like a yo-ho, 240 and then suddenly it's 280 and then it's something or other in order to accommodate more people, in order to fit into the electoral system so that parliament can become, I mean parliament becomes an arena for um, elite competition because being in parliament um, is an access to state resources as we know so there's a temptation to increase the numbers of people in parliament so you get supporters in that particular kind of way. Um, the last Mubarak parliament was going to be like that. It was pretty clear just before Mubarak fell that this was where the goodies were going to be distributed and every, every Egyptian who in the political caste was fighting to get into parliament, lots and lots in the same party competing for the same seat. The price of a seat got up to two million or three million dollars. All those kinds of things were happening, but that's, uh, that, that's something like, um, it's an echo in some way of, the, uh, of what was going on in the 1920s. Um, Another characteristic of this period is that the constitution, oh, sorry, next, next point, the electoral law, which is different from the constitution, but governs the elections, because the constitution doesn't necessarily say very much about that. And the electoral law is changed. Every single Egyptian election between 1923 and 1952 was held under a different law. And that, again, is something to be guarded against, although it may not be possible in these kinds of circumstances. I mean, it's very interesting. What happens is you look at the results of the 1923 elections, if you're a politician, and you try and work out, and we're now in a liberal system, should you have more or less constituencies if you want to do better next time? There's a lot of what used to be called by David Butler, the great English e expert, um, sophology, the science of elections. How does one interpret election results? 
Is it to do with constitutions? That's one way of, uh, is it to do with constituencies? You should have big ones, little ones, two people per constituency, five people per constituency. How do you do this in such a way as to advantage yourself and disadvantage your, your uh, competitors? So that's one way of thinking. Then one of the great things about liberalism, which I learned from the sadly now deceased Eric Hobsbawm, is that liberalism allows you to define who the people are, the sovereign people. And this is the history of England in the 19th century. The people turn out to be male whites with, and then with five pounds a year, then with some education, then the people become women and all kinds of things. I mean, generally you can tell that story as, as it's told in America as an enlargement of the franchise. Who are the people? Um, but I, the point I'm trying to make is, you know, when we say we the people, when they said we the people, perhaps that's the answer. The people who do these things can define who the people are, and they can define, and as it seems to me, the more I know about 19th and 20th century political history, the people at large are regarded as actually rather dangerous by most people in power. NASA, but no doubt politicians in Washington as well. Everybody thinks the people can only have the vote after they're educated. And so you, know, you have an educational qualification or you try and disbar people who you seem to think are incapable of choosing rationally between two political parties. So there's a lot of this about who are the people that goes on and on during the uh, 20s and 30s and may, may come back um, to haunt us. As far as I know, the Egyptian electoral law in the last election was the people were, can you remember? I think the people were everybody over 18. It was a remarkably young electorate. But that's not to say at the next election the people will be people over 25 or people this, that, you know. There will be some way in which you can define your electorate to suit your choice. Um, the third thing I think one learns about that long ago period of history um, is something that uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser pointed to when he decided that he was against parliamentary democracy in the 50s. He said to an Indian journalist in about 1956 or 57, what is democracy? I'll tell you what democracy used to be like. The large landowner got all his peasants in front of him, led them off to the polling station and told them who to vote for. That's democracy. And you can, of course, still make that comment in certain places about, you know, it's, there's alleged choice, but actually large numbers of people are persuaded for some reason or other to vote in a particular kind of way because they're beholden to the power structure in some kind of way. So, but in a peasant country, democracy is much more complicated because I don't think one can um, get away from uh, a situation in which those people who dominate the countryside um, can say to the people who to vote for. The one country in the Middle East that got away from this was um, was Turkey, but Turkey didn't have a peasantry, by, not in the east, in the west of the country when the Turkish d democratic experiment began under Ataturk in the 20s and 30s. They were what in England we would call yeomen, five-acre people who were, I think, can be assumed to know that they had a particular interest in agricultural policy and in roads and in subsidized fertilizer and all that kind of thing. But in a peasant country, it's unclear how peasant interest is, um, is defined. I mean, I think the reason why India got going as a democracy was that every election was won by the Congress party who had persuaded the peasants of India that it was in their interest to vote for Nero and the Congress party. It wasn't really a choice between two alternatives, and yet um, it did get the process of democracy going after a while. So this is another thing to think about. Are there peasants left in Egypt? I sometimes say to my leftist friends, comrade, where are the workers and peasants? Nobody knows whether they're peasants in Egypt um, or what is going on in the Egyptian countryside. Nobody goes into the Egyptian countryside. So it was impossible to do social science in the Egyptian countryside. You didn't get permission to go into the countryside 
unless you were Dutch or some, um, you belonged to some part of the world which was regarded as undangerous and therefore, if you were a Dutch woman, you could probably go into the countryside, but it's very difficult to conduct and think sociologically. So we don't know. We do know that the balance has changed in most Middle Eastern countries, but in Egypt, I think, it's still thought that it's about 50-50. 50 people live in the countryside. So what, what, what about democracy in the countryside um, when uh, the social relations are such that um, groups of people who will let us call peasants, however we try and define them, um, are not, cannot necessarily be expected to um, make up their mind. Then we have, of course, the, the secret ballot. I didn't go into that. That's very interesting. Anyway, uh, going back to 1923, um, there, there wasn't necessarily a secret ballot. You shouted out your... Uh, you were expected to say in a loud voice, particularly if you were illiterate, I vote for this, that, and the other person, and then uh, somebody listening outside could pay you five pounds or uh, give you a clip on the ear according to what they heard you vote. So we also have that, but um, at the moment I think we have a, you have a secret ballot um, and a desire by the people to be present in the polling stations as best they can. Um, and then we have um, the uh, concern with an appearance of legality, the appearance that regardless of what is going on, it is covered by the Constitution. And I don't quite know what to make of this, why people should be so concerned with legality. You might argue, I suppose, that the more dictatorial you are, the more you have to pretend that uh, you're doing something according to the Constitution and the law. But this certainly mattered to Ben Ali, the tyrant or the dictator in Tunisia. Whatever he did in order to limit the franchise, in order to disrupt and control the political process, it was done according to the Constitution. So that's another feature of the, the desire by competing groups in order that um, the Constitution should provide them with some kind of legal cover and then you have to have, um, uh, you have to have um, uh, uh, judges and so on who, and constitutional lawyers who have some way of judging this. Um, and then there are various other questions which we can, but that, like the length of the Constitution and so on. We have coming to um, Harvard from Egypt in about a couple of weeks' time a leading uh, constitutional lawyer from Egypt called Al Sharif, whose idea is that um, constitutions should be short, um, as short as possible. He likes the American Constitution. I can't. How many articles are in? anyway? There seem to be, by world standards, the American Constitution seems to be reasonably short. And then you have a constitutional court in order to adjudicate the inevitable, um, the inevitable challenges and so on. That seems to be one way of arranging uh, these kinds of things. Um, so uh, I think thinking about Egypt or thinking about Tunisia, one can see that it's not just the constitution, it's not just the electoral law, it's a whole host of things, including um, size, what is in the constitution, how constitutional disagreements are, um, are adjudicated, which have to be settled and are, and are subject to various forms of controversy and various forms of difficulty at the moment. And you can see why President Morsi, who, of whom none of us now have a very high opinion, thought that the whole point was, let's get the Constitution behind us, let's get some agreed document, um, so that we don't have to go back to it the whole time. Let's have a few elections, let's, let's play along with whatever the Constitution is for five years or ten years, and let's get used to it and let's see how it goes. But that hasn't proved possible partly because Morsi himself has undermined the very consensus that is necessary for a sufficient number of Egyptians to say, this is the constitution we want. How do you get constitutional legitimacy? You can have a referendum, but all you can say in a referendum is yes or no. And in all constitutional referendums, it seems people say yes, probably because they want to get the, you know, they want something in place 
they want a constitution. Um, but uh, if, if it's constantly subject to division, um, I mean, the liberals now in Egypt, the so-called liberals, the secularists and the Christians and so on, were demanding constitutional change even before the constitution had sort of was dry, the ink <coughs> was dry. Um, so uh, I think that's more or less what I want to say that um, there is, the, the first point is that constitutional moments, moments of enthusiasm, moments when the people manifest themselves, most when, when popular sovereignty is demanded, when the people are not, not just vague words, but are actually present. In the case of Tunisia at one stage, hammering on the door of the Constitutional Assembly, let us in, they said. We want to participate. And they had to be ejected. They sometimes rush into the Libyan Constitutional Assembly at the moment and have to be ejected because they say you're not representing the people of Miserata. Um, it is a very messy form of government, republican government, popular government. And we can, you know, we can see it trying to manifest itself, trying to organize itself. And I find it fascinating. But um, as I say, it gives you a very bumpy ride. Thank you. Uh, Roger, you began by emphasizing the Tunisian uh, part of mm -hmm. a pan-Arab event. Uh, just to help us with the uh, chronology, what, how would you define the main turning points in the Egyptian part of it, especially since then? You mean since Tahrir? Yes. Well, I think you would, you'd have to go through the revolutionary calendar, I think. Um, you know, the people manifested them, them the, 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 the people manifest themselves, the old regime crumbles, there are elections to a constituent assembly, I mean, various other things happen. Obama and uh, president gets on the phone and says things to them, you know, and the army does various kinds of things. I mean, there's always there's some sort of outside influence going on, which in this case was wholly to the good, I think. But President Obama and Hillary Clinton said to the generals, do not interfere, do not shoot. That's what they said. And of course, they're in a position to say that because um, America gives so much money to the Egyptian army. The Egyptian army is entirely beholden to the American administration. Um, so you move on to constitute. You move on to elections. Now, what? What? Then you decide what is the constituent assembly. We're now in about June 19, uh, 2011. Um, in Egypt, the constitu the constituent assembly is um, a constituent assembly. In Tunisia, it is both the government and the constituent assembly. So you have elections. As I say, they're won by the religious party. Then you have um, the constituent assembly deliberates and deliberates and deliberates. And um, that's more or less, you don't have, I mean, you have something called an assembly in both places, but it's not, it's not in any sense is uh, agreed upon, there isn't a consensus that it should be this, that, or the other. I think that's where we are after two years, just over two years, two and years and uh, three months. Uh, could we please ask people to identify themselves when they ask a question? Uh, wait just a minute. Just a short question. When you started with the spring, wouldn't be the comparison the springtime of the people in 1848? And isn't that a better model for a messy revolution with constitution giving and at the same time also running the government than either the French or the, the, the Russian one? Well, for us as historians, I think you might well say that. But it's not in the air in the same way. I think spring doesn't you know, spring doesn't mean the same thing in the Arab world. I think it was because Tunisia was a French organized, you know, was a French kind of country. And so people thought that it was like the East European spring. That was very much in the air. But I think when, when Thaura revolution comes in, I think we're in a world of different expectations. And that is, go, must take you and seems automatically to take everybody back to the American Revolution and the French Revolution and those as models for thinking about the revolutionary calendar, but also for thinking about how to 
explain the general messiness of trying to um, deal with a concept of popular sovereignty when the people are actually present in the squares and streets and refuse to demobilize themselves or have to be for forcibly demobilized. Yes. Yeah, okay. Sorry, J Judith Tucker from Georgetown. Um, you, you made the comment that, uh, which was an interesting comment, I thought, about the religious parties, mm. uh, particularly, I'm talking about Egypt now, not knowing what to do, really, mm -hmm. not really having a plan. And I was wondering about that because, I mean, if you look at the Muslim Brothers' political platforms mm -hmm. for the last decade, um, they had some ideas about what they wanted to do, um, for sure. Mm -hmm. But, of course, in the present context, you wonder if it's more a matter, I mean, I wonder if it's a more a matter of, of political constraints they face. In other words, it's not so much an ideological weakness, because I think there are some ideas about what's mm -hmm. out there, about what, you know, what an Islamic state would look like. Mm -hmm. um, but there's, you know, there's the problem of international pressure, there's a problem of Salafists on the right, mm -hmm. there's the problem of the liberal opposition, I mean, there, there's the problem of the leftist groups. I mean, they're facing mm -hmm. so many constraints on the ground that mm -hmm. is, is that perhaps uh, uh, more the problem than just they're, you know, they're, they're lacking uh, assurance about which way to proceed. It's, it's very difficult to think about this, and, um, and we don't really know. Somebody was talking in the newspaper today about, uh, oh, it was an um, editorial in the Financial Times saying that, uh, to do with the IMF negotiations, saying the Egyptians should have be given money, more money than they've asked for from the uh, International Monetary Fund but they must stop being two governments. The Muslim Brothers um, uh, Directorate of, of the Sheikh of the Azhar or whoever is calling the shots should not, that the Muslim Brothers in office should be behave, behave like politicians. But I don't think that can happen in that particular kind of re religious organization. And I think it goes back to um, you know, what is an Islamic economy, let's say. How can you get from the Quran and the, sh the Sharia and the Hadith and so on? I mean, how can you get from the Torah to a Jewish economy? How can you get from the Bible to a Christian economy? It, you know, there is a mismatch there, which I think has something to do with it. I know that the Muslim brothers are full of young economists who seem to know, but then the young economists, there's only one economy, there's only one sort of economics around at the moment. There was a young man from Tunisia talking to us the other day. You know, you just simply, you have to talk the language of neoliberalism when what you need is planning. Um, and neoliberalism says cut subsidies, cut this, cut that, which is polit politically impossible. So you have to somehow, well, that's where we are at the moment, how you, how you find some way of, um, of managing that. They do seem to have had a good idea, the gentleman from the State Department might tell us, about having smart cards that they're going to issue to the population go back to a system of rationing to get rid of the subsidies. So everybody gets a certain amount of subsidized food, and for the rest, it ha you have to pay market prices. But Steve, the, that's a question yeah. directed to you. Do you want to? I, I can't speak for State Department Policy. I'm the lead <laughs> analyst of the department. But I've, as long as I'm on the spot, I might as well just ask a question, um, which is given the intract intractable economic problems that all of these countries face that are going through these periods of revolution, Arab Spring, however you want to describe them. Do you see these economic problems as accelerating this, as this process of, of elections and more laws and constitution rewriting because you are going to have a public that's dissatisfied with whoever is elected and their inability to address these problems caught between a vice of the IMF on one hand and popular demands on the other? I mean, I think psychologically, as far as I understand people living in Cairo, you're caught between lack of security and um, everything else, lack of jobs, lack of food. I mean, or, you know, the economic and the security. And I think at the moment, this is where Napoleon and the whiff of grape shot comes in, that you know, for middle class people who can somehow get by, it may be that the desire for security will overcome the desire for... Um, significant economic change, and that would be one way of, uh, of, of, of thinking about that. Dave. 
Uh, my name is Stephen Shore. I understand the one unique feature of the Egyptian economy is, or was, its heavy dependence on revenues from tourism. Mm -hmm. So how on earth could you get an Islamic or any other kind of economy unless you have an environment that is at least as no less attractive than Mubarak's rule was in, in terms of drawing um, people to see the, the museum in Cairo and tour the pyramids? I think that the reason why, I mean, tourism is down because there's um, a recession in Europe at the moment. And I don't think that when it revives, the fact that um, women in bikinis will be seen on the beaches of um, the Red Sea or something or other is an enormously important matter. And I think the commercial aspect and the hotelier aspect of the Muslim Brothers is sufficient that they will not put up with people who try and interfere with the tourists. There will be some isolated things. Um, and I think that kind of tourism is quite good, actually, because that's how the Tunisians organized it. The Tunisians were on, uh, the, the Europeans doing their European sunbathing bit were on certain beaches in Hammamat and so on. But it didn't really impinge necessarily on the lives of the uh, sturdy peasants living inside the country. So I'm not sure about that. I mean, that, um, and I think in the, in, to, you know, I think, s but I think that um, this raises a question that I should have talked about. I mean, I think the future of North Africa is obviously a European future. That's where they sell most of their goods and that's where they get most of their revenues from. And so they will have to have an accommodation with somehow or other with the governments of the Mediterranean side, the French and the Italians and so on, about these kinds of things and the need to allow it to happen and not to be interfered with in any kind of way. That would seem to me the obvious future, that you look across the Mediterranean and try and organize it in a kind of way through the tour operators. The Germans were rather good at that at one stage. They, uh, they had uh, people on, Air, on Lufthansa telling people who were going to Islamic countries that you must take your shoes off before you go into a mosque and you must be respectful of, you know, you must, commerce must find an accommodation, I think. I'm Joel Rayburn from the National Defense University. And uh, uh, to begin with, uh, Google tells me that the line, what's past this prologue, is from Act Two of The Tempest. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> um, uh, having served in Iraq, um, I. I can tell you with my own eyes that the border between that bisects the Jazeera and the Euphrates Valley does not exist mm -hmm. for the people on either side of it. It's a, it's a dirt mound that's not higher than this room, which is unguarded, and the people on either side uh, act as though it's not there. Mm -hmm. So there's no, from my own experience, there's, there's no barrier between the Syrian conflict and Iraq and vice versa. Um, but I wonder, what, what does history tell us about whether the revolution— and the new order, the emerging new order in North Africa, uh, is or can be insulated from the conflict in the Levant. I mean, I mean the Eastern Levant. Yes. Well, I think the key is Egypt, and I don't know that I, we could persuade the Egyptians that they're North African. Um, but, but that's the way in which the, the two worlds are connected, it seemed to me, through Cairo and through the close proximity to Palestine and so on. And um, I'm not sure how that will work out in the future. But I have a feeling that the two parts of the Arab world are pretty much divided. And I didn't talk about the oil states, of course, which are beyond that. Um, so that's, uh, so I, feel, I feel that um, when one is thinking about the future of, that, of the, the, your part of the eastern part of the Arab world, um, Boundaries don't matter, but they do. I mean, Syria is Syria and Iraq is, you know, whatever happens, Jordan is Jordan, Lebanon is Lebanon. That, it's, it's what to do about the leftover problems in these countries, which have survived and re recovered, well, got over an experiment by two dictators, Hafez al-Assad and uh, Saddam Hussein, to impose a non-sectarian nationality on Iraqis and Syrians, quite successfully, it seems to me. But that's gone now, and the whole system has been sectarianized in the eastern part of the Arab world. And then borders don't matter in the sense that Iranian 
weapons will pass all over the place and leftover Iraqi weapons will pass all over the place and so on. And it's a mess. It's a mess. I wouldn't like to have to deal with it if I was a John Kerry or somebody, even to begin to think about it. But I do think, going back to Sykes-Picot, recognizing... To, well, I think you have to recognize two things. One is why the, the eastern part of the Arab world was carved up in the way that it did. And then the second, why, after a period of secular dictatorships, you get rampant sectarianism all over the place, for which I think the Iraq war is, is somehow responsible for. And that's a very poisonous and dangerous situation. I mean, I think one wants to get to back to some notion of patriotism, not nationalism, that somehow the Syrians are united because they say our country is very beautiful and our girls are more beautiful than your girls and our cooking is more and our mountains and all these kinds of things. You want to get back to some feeling about, you know, not ideas about Syrian nationality, that it has to be this, that, or the other. But somehow or other, the Syrians do seem to love Syria. And I take some comfort from the fact that Syrians in London don't kill each other, or Iraqis during, you know, that the, they don't spill over these things. So there's a kind of residue of love of country um, that one could probably work f work with, I can't quite, but which might get over this terrible sectarianism that is affecting everybody at the moment. Yes. Uh, Landis Jones, uh, University of Louisville. Uh, you seem, in defining revolution, to emphasize political. Um, as a student of comparative government and of American constitutional law, uh, we usually differentiate the American Revolution as being different from many later ones in that it was totally political. I, I'm not sure that you intended to uh, emphasize the Arab Spring as being totally political. Uh, it seems to me there are a whole lot of social issues that have whelmed up here, including uh, the rights of women. Yes, I mean, I would say the causes are all over the place, but the causes are certainly economic. Uh, that's why people found their way into the streets and so on, partly because of bread. But I think at this constitutional moment, there is no disposition to think about economic matters and redistribution in of income or anything of that kind. And whether that's because of it's the neoliberal moment, whether it's because the religious governments either can't or won't, aren't interested in that kind of thing, um, that seems to be where we are at the moment. That's, I mean, at some stage, well, to go back a bit, the, what used to be the left in the Arab world was incorporated within the revolutionary regimes of Nasser and so on. So there isn't, there isn't any representative, political representative of people who want some redistribution of income that are politically relevant at the moment. But in time, that must remedy itself. The left will, the old secular left, will revive itself and find a constituency, but it, we're not there yet. So I, I would say it's a pretty much a political event at the moment, the, s the spring to revolution. John and then Ross. Hi, I'm Don Wolfensberger with the Wilson Center. I thought it was interesting uh, when you were mentioning the fact that so many of these countries, before the inks even dry on a constitution, are already trying to rewrite it, and that would, wouldn't it be nice if they had a little 10-year hiatus before they revisit the constitution? I would offer, though, a, a sort of a counterfactual. If we had done that in the U.S., uh, the whole thing would have fallen apart, because there was a great deal of pressure to have a second constitutional convention before was submitted to the states for ratification. Madison uh, fought that, but certainly he realized when the, all the directives came in from the states, uh, instructions, in fact, to, to further amend the Constitution, that they darn well better do that in the first Congress, which they did by submitting 12 amendments uh, to the states. But uh, And two states didn't even come in to the Union until the Bill of Rights was ratified, uh, Rhode Island and North Carolina. So I'm not sure your 10-year rule would have worked out too well here. Mm -hmm. Yes, I take that as a comment, and as I... <laughs> uh, Ross Johnson, Wilson Center. Um, the question that I, I suppose has no, no answer, um, why the um, sort of 
inevitability of the of the revolutionary calendar. Um, you know, one one thought that uh, elections without um, some prior development of, of of civic society make no sense, and yet there must be elections. And mm -hmm. and you know, we see how that plays out in in in, in other places too, Gaza, you name it. Um, I suppose the question would be, can we find any case where there's any kind of um, pause or thinking, maybe we don't really want to have the election yet. Um, the comment would be, um, I suppose in, 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 in the Eastern Levant and elsewhere, one would like to see patriotism developing, as you suggest. <laughs> Comparative experience um, doesn't give us much reason to think that can happen. If we think about the former Soviet Union, if we think about Yugoslavia, um, artificial states held together with some coercion, um, once that um, relaxes, disappears, um, ethnic, sectarian tensions seem to be inevitable. And I'm not sure you can ever get past that. We couldn't in those countries, so should we have any optimism in the countries you're describing? I don't know. I mean, we may be back to the old saw that the, the democracies are only European or the European dependencies, that there's something about history and something about culture and so on that you have to have in order to manage um, peaceful competition and uh, establish the rules. I mean, it is difficult to find satisfactory practicing democracies outside Europe in Africa and places like that. So um, uh, so I don't really know how to say anything terribly helpful about that because these are large um, kinds of things. I mean what I what I'm I suppose trying to say is maybe this is complete this is something that has not happened in uh, human history before that we're also talking about in Egypt and Tunisia where the people appear in very large numbers in the center of the, like in Tahrir or in, uh, in uh, the Avenue Bourguiba in uh, Tunis, in an atmosphere, having overthrown a dictatorship and calling for a, calling for a new order. How do, how, who represents the people without elections? And how, are the, how can the people be present in a political structure without a constitution? I mean, it, it seems to me logical, although not necessary. I mean, we can probably think of other occasions when similar things happened, but this didn't happen. But I'm struck. I mean, maybe that's the answer. They're not copying the French. It's just simply, if the people are present and, have to, and can't draw up a constitution by themselves, you have to have representatives. How do you do that? You must have elections. And then, as I say, the elections are won by the, by the religious parties. There is a kind of iron logic about that that I see. I would like people to quarrel with me about that, but I think that's what I see. And therefore, people who, do, people who don't like that, like, uh, like uh, Basra al-Assad, say, we're not, you know, not on my turf. <laughs> Uh, just a minute, Dave. Are you the Ottawa of Ottawa, the North African? Yes. 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 So. Um, I, I want to follow on to Ross's question, which <coughs> I think he was I'm not sure you joined each other. The question is what we saw in Yugoslavia, which mm -hmm. I covered as a journalist, the falling apart. Um, ethnic nationalism that's been so strong, you know, all the new nations of Yugoslavia are based on ethnic identities and so are they in Eastern Europe. So why should Syria or Iraq be different and what's going to hold them together when you have centrifugal forces like Kurdistan and Iraq and I don't know where the Alawites are going to go, whether they're going to go to Latakia and set up their own little enclave or whatever. But anyway, um, when you have now ethnic, burning ethnic nationalism, in, in, in particularly in the Levant, um, what's going to keep them together? Why, why, why should we not consider Sykes Pico as <clears throat> going to be rewritten mm -hmm. on the streets and in the mountains? Mm -hmm. 
Well, there, I mean, there is an interesting parallel with Yugoslavia in that Tito uh, kept uh, managed to create a Yugoslav identity, of course, and there was, of course, a Yugoslav identity that um, goes back in time. And uh, Yugoslavs talk very nice, happily about their football team, their soccer team in the 1920s and 30s and so on. So there's something to work with, and then he's swept away. But I think that takes a territorial form in the in the Balkans, doesn't it? And I don't think any of these, um, as it were, alternative popular movements in any Arab country have taken that form. I was talking to somebody back, just back, with great enthusiasm from Kurdistan, um, Iraqi Kurdistan, and which is doing extremely well. And um, but the la they're not going to break away from, for various kinds of reasons. But they're not. There are no um, irredentist movements, as far as I can tell, um, except perhaps, you know, one might, Algeria is a bit of a thought provoker at the moment, but uh, at the moment, people are, it's a fight within existing national boundaries for control over existing national resources. It may change, you're right, but I don't see perhaps other people you know, in theory, it's a possibility, but it doesn't seem to be on the cards. Dave. David Nichols, a, um, I work as a historian at the State Department. You uh, said that the model of the Iranian revolution and mm. republic hasn't had a lot of influence. Um, do you feel that there's any um, that that experience, though, that historical event is useful. How, how useful do you think it is for thinking about what's going on there now? Or do you think it's such a unique event that mm. it, it's not very helpful? Well, I think it's, I think it's interesting to think about it. it. It is an Islamic constitution. It's half an Islamic constitution, as you know. It's half the Belgian constitution. And so it's very uh, contradictory. Um, it says everybody can do this, and then the next thing says subject to the Sharia or something rather. But you know, we, but you not only have something calling itself an, uh, an Islamic constitution, but it's you have um, nearly thirty years. Are we talking about? I can't do my geography. I can't do my uh, mathematical calculation. But we have thirty years of practice of running this constitution, and elections are held regularly, and so on and so on. Of course, we also know that it's to, the supreme guide is there to do something or other, to make sure that it doesn't go off the rails. Um, but nevertheless, it would seem to me there is something to be learnt from that 30 years, not just of the Constitution itself, but the fact it hasn't been amended significantly. It is a, it is a reliable guide to the way power is distributed um, in Iran, and it is a reliable guide to political practice. So there's something there. I didn't say they all have to adopt it, but the fact that they refuse to even, the brothers and so on, refuse even to look at it seems to me um, a bit silly. And it can only be put down to a kind of crazy anti-Persian prejudice in the Arab world, which of course there's plenty of reason for that. But. Thank you. Uh, Jeff Rieger, Georgetown University. Um, your discussion of, uh, of Egypt in the 1920s was fascinating. And, and for me, uh, the most interesting part was that it didn't really resonate with uh, the experience in North Africa right now, or Egypt in particular, but much more so the, uh, the monarchies like Jordan, uh, Kuwait, Bahrain. So I was wondering if you could um, perhaps talk a bit more about the monarchies, if, you know, if we can group them as such, understanding that Morocco is much different from Jordan from uh, the Gulf monarchies. But thank you. I mean, that's, that's the big puzzle, and Greg Gores and all kinds of people in our field talk about why the monarchies have been able to contain um, the spring rather better. And it's very difficult to know because it's a, you're arguing a negative. Why hasn't something happened? Why haven't been people um, uh, hammering on the palace doors? Although it's tr also true, even in the Arab countries, the palaces have not fallen. The, nobody... Nobody has actually attacked a presidential palace. I think I'm right in saying, aren't I? Pardon? Yemen. Yes, what? The president, yes, the president. Well, it's a house, but it's also a fortified army camp in Sana'a, isn't it? And it has anti-aircraft guns all around it and so on. Um, 
I, we d I don't think anybody has come up with that, whether it's a kind of deference, whether it's uh, that the, the, the monarchies managed to make significant concessions in time, but their day will come because their model is the British model of constitutional monarchy. And, you know, we can see how that is, um, um, you know, how that, I think Morocco is a very good example of two steps forward and one step backwards, that the king allows this and then, but he, he meant, he, it's rather like England under um, Elizabeth, I think, or Charles I or something. Um, you have ministries perhaps controlled even by members of his family, the interior and foreign ministry and so on. So you, you have a kind of differentiated system. And maybe as you get in, you may get in uh, Tunisia and somewhere like that, you will also get somehow an understanding that there are certain things that you can say and certain things you can't say. You know, at the beginning of the Const Tunisian constitution, there's meant to be a list of sacred things that the people of the book, you are not supposed to say anything rude about <coughs> people of the, the three people of the book. If you're an agnostic, I wonder sometimes what Ganushi would say about people like me. I think you're not allowed to be an atheist, I think, in Tunisia, but that may be a bit rarefied um, at this particular point. At least make sure that the Christians, the Jews, and the Muslims are respecting each other's traditions and that there is some kind of understanding that it is, it is explosive to actually say something about somebody else's faith, but um, that's about as far as we've got. Um, Ayaz Hussein, also from the Historians of the State Department. Um, should we think of the events of really 2011, 2011, 2012, as the passage of a threshold moment or the start of a phase of considerable instability? Why not both? I tell my students, it doesn't, everything doesn't have to be either or. I mean, I think it's a threshold in the sense there's no going back. But that tells you nothing about going forward. I mean, it tells you that the, the iron logic has led one to elections, religious government, and fierce constitutional debate. Um, but where that will lead to, and as we've been talking, in the context of great economic unhappiness, discontent, neoliberal economic policies and so on, I don't know. I really don't know. I mean, it, you know, it's, it's, it hasn't worked itself out yet. If the point of a, you know, revolutions have to lead to a new political order. There is no agreement on a new political order and no agreement in sight as far as I can see. Uh, Kent Hughes at the Wilson Center. Thank you. Very stimulating talk. Uh, you've mentioned a number of times Egypt and others being constrained by a, a neoliberal moment. Mm -hmm. Yet you have considerable ongoing success of the East Asian miracle countries mm -hmm. and even occasional talk about a so-called Beijing consensus. Couldn't that influence the economic approach of the Arab Spring? In what kind of way would you think? You mentioned the need for uh, some a degree of planning, which certainly has characterized Japan, Taiwan, Korea, and so forth, at the same time taking advantage of markets where it worked. Well, I mean, I think two things have happened. Planning was tried and was thought to have failed and then gave way to more liberal economic thinking, which is associated with this notion of infita, which is a sort of vague translation of opening up and globalization and liberalization. Um, there, uh, there is that, but I think what you have is a um, different relationship between the business community and the, the government. I mean, for people like me, we are taught to believe that the relationship between the Japanese government and the Japanese business community, or the uh, Singapore one, was right. You know, you don't hammer the business community, you try and guide it in various kinds of ways, and, and it, it's export-oriented and so on, and all the kinds of right things. Whereas in Tunisia and uh, uh, Tunisia and Egypt, the business community was hammered, nationalized, so you lose the entrepreneurs, so you get a second generation of entrepreneurs who come in and become state monopolists, and you get crony capitalism, which we haven't mentioned, but that seems to be. And then, and then the recovery from crony capitalism, which I haven't met, what do you do with all the state assets that have either been 
despoiled or taken into the hands of uh, uh, Ben Ali's wife, uh, Leila Trabulsi. What do you do with them? Well, you go on managing them, I think, but they're still what they are, monopolies not particularly concerned with export. So we have a, so we have a desire to, you know, neo, neoliberalism should get you opening up, but you're not quite sure what you ha how to export and even to begin to think about what, how that, what, what your assets are that might export. Uh, we need to bring this, begin to bring this uh, session to a close. Could we ask for a last uh, question or so? Well, I guess my question hasn't been answered. <laughs> Why is this a worldwide phenomenon that somehow or other, mysteriously, it's in everybody's genes and everybody's historical memory, that revolutions are followed by elections and um, new constitutions? Is there no other model? I guess I would say a revolution always tries to legitimate itself, so mm -hmm. it has a constitutional election. Mm -hmm. so I mean, but. It, you know, it requires a great deal of self-consciousness, I think. The Egyptians have to say, we are having a revolution, and not only are we are having a revolution, but we are having a revolution like all world revolutions. They're not saying we can have a different kind of revolution when we all do something completely different. Um, it has to be put, I there's, a, there's a notion that this is a moment in history where you draw a line under the past. This is a French notion. A constitution is a kind of mark that one era is over and a new era is beginning. And people seem, at least when we say people, it, the elite is heavily invested in that particular notion. Judith, yes. Yeah, but, the, but the resonance is always with Europe, with the French, with the, mm. so have you heard at all, oh, sorry, have you heard at all of, of you know, is, uh, people talk about China, for example, yes. right? Um, I th I'm less likely to think they will refer uh, directly to, the, to Russia, but yeah. the Chinese Revolution. Yes. I, I, and I don't remember hearing people yeah. cite China, Chinese Revolution. Why not in there this moment? There are a story? few Maoists and a few Trotskyites around in, uh, in Egypt who talk about these things, but these are... Uh, that was a way of being different at one stage, but I don't know that much thinking has gone into what a Maoist or a um, Russian constitution would look like. Although, of course, people have probably read Kerensky and so on, but they don't seem to that they don't seem to be thinking about that or even Trotsky. Uh, we hope everyone will join us to continue the conversation over a glass of wine. We want to thank you, Roger. For thank you, thank you, thank you for all coming. Thank you. Useful, intriguing discussion. Thank you. Wine is sherry or wine is. I, it must be. If it's you, it must be. Uh, no, here it's actually wine. Oh, it is wine.